Welcome to the bestest, most funnest part of teaching ever, grading. Yay, totally not being sarcastic there. Okay, so let's take a look at some uh, rhetorical analysis paragraphs. We are starting with one that is about Tony Romo and his damaged back. So let's take a look. What I've done here is I bolded the topic sentence and then I went ahead and I highlighted the evidence in the commentary so that it would be a little easier for us to talk about. So in the article, the author uses Tony Romo's pers in the article, the author uses Tony Romo's perspective helps the reader connect with the football star quarterback. The author uses the perspective of Romo to relate to pathos. So first question, do you have the author's name? Yep, we're good. Second question, do you know what it is you're going to focus on in terms of what rhetorical choice the author has made? Yep, that's gonna be pathos. However, can I just say, pathos is actually a very technical term. Unless you have read Aristotle's book, Rhetoric, you probably should not be using it. Can we please just say um, that Romos utilizes strong emotional appeals? So don't get technical because then you have a chance that you're going to trip on a technicality and use the word in a slightly wrong way. So you do have a rhetorical choice there. Uh, with pathos, but I would prefer if you just said strong emotional appeal. Last one, do you have a message? That should be the heart of any rhetorical analysis paragraph. What do you think? Yeah, we're missing a message here. I should have something in here about, you know, in the article, Tony Romo, Helps the reader connect. Well, Tony Romo is the writer. So uh, helps the reader connect with the football star quarterback. The author uses perspective of Ramos to relate to pathos. It's just, it's awkwardness there. It's Tony Romo is doing this. In order to drive home the message that personal failure is insignificant in the face of in the face of um, supporting the team. Okay, then if I did this, I could say, okay, this is what my commentary is going to focus on. But the problem is that message was missing up front. And because of that, commentary is probably going to struggle because there's not going to be anything to really tie it back to. So let's take this out. Let's see what the author originally had. And then we are going to take a look at the evidence in the commentary. Uh, the speaker does this by giving the reader a personal story of Romo getting hurt and how he came out of it. So that's the, it's a little bit of the why. It's a little factual, but I can certainly live with it. Uh, Romo uses words like soul crushing and chances for success diminish. Are those correctly embedded? Yep. Heck yeah. In fact, I really like those two quotes being pulled together because there is a lot of personal failure in there. Okay. These connect to the reader on an emotional level. Do you know what I'm going to immediately ask you? Why? Why are those words so effective? You're not talking to me about why those words. Uh, on an emotional level, by referencing... by talking about the soul, the most important part of a person as being crushed 
the feeling created is of utter devastation. Okay. And then at that point, now I can see, okay, that is the rhetorical effect of pulling that. This is the ever dreaded assumption. And you're not telling me why you're making that assumption. Why are those words going to connect with the reader? Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, the speaker takes the reader through a whirlwind of emotions by using language like this. Okay, timed writing, I can accept that. Um, it's a little vague. Like, what are you talking about there? But timed writing, sometimes that's going to happen. If the speaker were to use brighter language, the appeal to pathos would not be as strong compared to the language the speaker uses. Again, I like the reasoning. I'm not quite sure what they mean by brighter language. So it's a little unclear. We're a little vague bookie here. Uh, the speaker shows his relation to pathos in a dark way. Uh, run on sentence. It's almost a way that makes a person feel sympathetic. I like this. You're talking about the effect of the language. I really like that. But my question is, why do you say that? So the, this commentary, it certainly has reasoning. But I think part of the problem here is there's no strong message up front. So the commentary has nothing to tie back to. So we're doing some vagueness here that's really sort of not attractive in a paragraph. Okay, let's take a look at the second half. But again, with no message up front, we're going to be in trouble. Even more importantly, <clears throat> uh, the author appeals to pathos through using inspiring language. Romo says he more than... Okay, Romo says he more than anyone knows that Dak Patterson, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, or uh, Prescott, I don't know if I'm saying Dak, Dak, whatever, uh, had to prove himself and saying he's earned the right to be our quarterback. Uh, Romo even states that as hard as it is for me to say, he's earned that right. In this statement, he is admitting when there is someone more deserving of the role that he has worked for his entire life. So question, are those quotes correctly embedded? Yep, they are. So let's take a look at the commentary. The use of Romo's perspective can help the reader relate to Romo rather than an article with an outsider's perspective where there would be no appeal to pathos. I can see where they're going. Um, and I think what you're talking about here with perspective is the use of pronouns. Perspective is a slightly different thing. So, but I do get where you're going and I like that. The use, uh, Romo's use of first person uh, can help the reader relate to him uh, rather than an article with an objective point of view where there would be no appeal to pathos. The choice of Romo to relate to pathos when talking about the subject, help people relate to him and how he was saying that everyone goes through a tough time, but he's not talking about everyone's going through a tough time here. This is the part that's inspirational. So again, the commentary is sliding off and a big part of that is going to be, there's no message up front to tie back to. It's like, what is Tony Romo trying to do? Uh, if there were a message up front, I think this would be a lot stronger because what I am seeing that's really well done here is that you have good reasoning. You have excellent evidence. The evidence is well embedded. The structure is very clean. It's just that without a message up front, everything becomes very sort of vague and scattered. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. This one is my zombie myself. In My Zombie Myself, Chuck Klosterman uses pop culture to communicate his message that humanity is capable of tolerating the, the not only challenging, but repetitive tasks in life. First question, do you have the author's name? Excellent. 
You do, Chuck Klosterman. Next question, do you have a rhetorical choice? Yep, his choice to use pop culture. Next question, do you have a message that the author is going to try and push? Woohoo! Great message. Humanity is capable of tolerating these, these uh, challenging, repetitive tasks in life. Um, slightly different than the message I got, but you know what? That's okay, because that's the beautiful thing about rhetorical analysis. You're sharing your interpretation, and as long as you can support it, you're right. Uh, he uses modern day examples in order to connect with his younger audience. So that's a claim. So that, that Clusterman is trying to connect to a younger audience. While explaining how his friend felt confident in his ability to kill zombies, Clusterman tells the story of a time him and his friends went to a haunted maze at the Bard of Terror. Because many young adults cannot relate to deleting 400 work emails on a Monday morning or filling out paperwork that only generates more, Clusterman Clusterman chose to include an idea that all ages are familiar with, Halloween. Okay, first question, are the quotes correctly embedded? Okay, next question, is this focused on pop culture? I don't know the burn of terror and Halloween are pop culture. Those are American culture. Um, but pop culture tends to be things that appeal only to a younger audience and y Barnes of Terror and Halloween are kind of universal. Okay, in addition, Klosterman states, assume a zombie takeover has transpired. He then goes on to discuss all the concepts one may have learned from watching a television or playing video games, a few of which include don't travel at night, don't let zombies spit on you, and a direct second bullet uh, second bullet into the brainstem. Now, this is feeling much more pop culture because these are movie references and movie references that, you know, that not everyone is going to get because it is a little bit more pop culture-y because not everyone watches Zombieland. So I would actually say this would be stronger if we focus just on the pop culture evidence. Okay. Yes, that makes it shorter, but having more stuff that's not focused on what you're saying does not make it better. More is not better. Better is better. Okay. By using the modern day examples of television shows and video games, and if you notice, if I had kept in there that first set of evidence about haunted Halloween barns and work emails, my commentary would have been not relating to my evidence as well. So it is better for having deleted that. By using the modern day examples of television shows and video games, Klosterman is able to grab readers' attention in order to explain his message in a way that relates to his audience. You know what I'm going to ask? Why? Why is that language particularly good at grabbing a reader's attention. What is it about that? So by using modern day examples of television shows and video games, Klosterman is appealing to his audience using a medium that the audience is more likely to, um, the, more likely to relate to, specifically television and video games. Uh, this helps him communicate his message that humanity can tolerate challenging but repetitive tasks in life. Well, where is the repetitive tasks in life here? I think that you would need to relate it to the, the message a little better. Um, he then goes on to discuss the concepts one may have learned from watching television or playing video games, a few of which include don't travel at night, blah, blah, blah. He relates these to more mundane ideas such as having to delete 
And then, of course, I would have to go and look it up. But quote, five million emails, blah, blah, blah. And then by using the modern day examples of television and video games, Klosterman is able to grab the reader's attention and never say grab the reader's attention. Every word should do that. So if it's true of everything, it's not worth mentioning. Is able to explain his message in a way that relates to his audience by focusing on a medium they know and care about, such as television, Klosterman turns that into uh, turn. Klosterman focuses on how similar zombies are to those emails modern Americans are forced to deal with. Without pop culture, readers would have a hard time connecting with the message being presented. Maybe, maybe not, but certainly that's a personal interpretation. This is why his use of pop culture is so effective at communicating his message. Okay. And so that would be a little bit stronger now. But one of the things I'm seeing is there is this habit of kind of wandering off task a little bit. Make sure that everything there is part of an argument. Okay, we are now up to the Iron Horse, um, which was, of course, Lou Gehrig's nickname before he got a horrible, horrible disease. Lou Gehrig used his plethora of personal relationships to convey how thankful he was for everything he had. Do you have an author? Good. Do you have a rhetorical choice? Yep. Personal relationships. But guys, you have got to be more careful with vocabulary. Plethora means you have too much. So um, originally, it was, you know, you would say something like, you know, this individual has a plethora of blood. And that was a sign that the medieval practitioner needed to bring in leeches to get some of the blood out because there was too much. So the only way plethora works here is if what you're saying is he has too many and it's somehow damaging to him, which means this is the wrong word. Okay. Do you have a message? Yes. That he's thankful for everything he had. Uh, it would be nice if it were a little bit more generalized because really what, what Garrig is trying to tell people is that individuals should be grateful for whatever they have in their life. He's not just talking about himself, but certainly you're in the ballpark. Okay. He brought to light how many friends uh, he, he brought to light how many friends he made throughout his career. Believing he was extremely lucky, he said it was an honor to have known Jake Rupert and Ed Barrow, an extremely prominent figure in baseball at the time. Moreover, he even states how the New York Giants sent him a gift. Okay, is that correctly embedded? Okay. Now... It, are those really powerful quotes that show thankfulness? Well, this lucky and honor, yes. Um, everyone sort of gets a gift when they retire. So I, I'm not sure there. But our structure is good. It all comes down to the commentary. The effect of this nonstop listing of friends and acquaintances say helps Gehrig convey his true happiness with what he had achieved. 
Okay, I like this because you're talking about what he is doing with language. What is Garrick doing with language? He is listing, 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 listing. What is the effect of that list? It conveys true happiness. So I do like this right here. So that's really kind of tight. He expressed true delight when he lists everyone he knew. How? I'm, I'm not seeing true delight there. There's no diction in the evidence that shows delight. So I would get rid of that. Uh, because of this, the reader is better, uh, is better, is able to better comprehend how the people he met along the way made it worth every moment he had spent playing. Well, how does the language do that? I have nothing in the evidence that's about every moment of playing. So again, um, no. If he was not happy with the outcome of his time playing, he would have made a slight reference to it or even shown pity to himself on how he will never get to play again. Okay. That is absolutely legit to talk about what an author doesn't do. Yeah, that's a rhetorical choice too. So I do like that. However, he does not, and he continues to cite his main source of joy when he did play, his friends. Woohoo! Someone who knows how to use sentence structures. That makes me happy. Even more significantly, Garrick references his blithesome relationship. Oh, no! No, 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 no. Um, watch your vocab. Watch your vocab. Because his mother-in-law takes his side all the time. Oh, I, oh it, no, that is not what he says. You can't say things that aren't true. Even against his own daughter, sometimes he states that he is truly blessed. Uh, Garrig also say he is extremely thankful that his father and mother worked all their lives so he could have an education and build his body. Is the evidence correctly embedded? Yes. Okay, so let's take a look at commentary, and this time I'm going to ask you some questions about it. His repeated references to all the joyous moments he shares with his family allude to the fact that he frequently is around his family and that he enjoys it. Does, he, does that evidence show that he is with his family? No. So the evidence and the commentary aren't matching well. Okay, let's keep going. The overall repetitiveness of good experience in his speeches expressed no regrets and made the reader believe he would be happy to re retire to his family, the people who knew him, and made him who he is. Okay. Does the evidence show an overall repetitiveness of good experiences? Yes, but probably not in this section. Um, but you do see it in this top section. So not ideal, but I can see that within the paragraph, I do have a repetitiveness of good experiences. Okay, because he makes such an endearing claim, most people would want to agree with this decision to enjoy his content life with his loving family. Why? This That's feeling awkward and it's not supported. So I would probably get rid of that. Um, in essence, Garrick's use of relationships showed the reader how he was thankful for all he had done and everything he had. He would not have wanted to change anything. Okay. I think part of the thing here is because the claim up front, because that position up front in the topic sentence um, is a little too narrow. Garrig is not just talking about himself. He's talking about how relationships bring joy to life, a little more generic. Um, the commentary just feels a little bit off here. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Okay, Dave, I have no idea how to say his last name, so I'm just going to skip it this time. 
used repetition in his speech to make the kids understand that the stuff they did will not go unnoticed because of the loss. Do you have the name? Yep. Do you have a rhetorical choice? Woohoo! Repetition. Do you have a message? Yep. Now, are you going to tell me why I am a little unhappy with that message? Yeah, we are vague booking again. Make the kids understand that failure does not imply That, it, that they will, don't tell me what it's, tell me what is, don't tell me what is not. But they will go unnoticed. Okay. Seriously, if you put stuff in your, th in your topic sentence, you know that you're already being too vague and you're not being clear. Okay. The repetition of more positive phrases and words will stick with the kids more. Um, and I do like the reference to kids because of course that's the audience. I wouldn't call them kids because technically that's slang. So I could use children, but that's so generic. I am, why is he speaking to them? Because they are young athletes and he was their coach. Uh, but I do like that reference to audience there. A uh, guy whose name I can't say repeats the phrase, that's us, and friends forever. He also repeats the word jumping as he lists off the people who appreciate the effort the team put in and re even repeats the phrase, they like. Are those correctly embedded? Yep. Do those show a pattern? Do they work together as positive phrases? Yep, they do. Okay, so why is Dave doing this? To show the kids are going to be raised in a positive light. So we're going right into what does the language show? And I'm seeing those little transition phrases. Uh, these kids have just come off a heartbreaking loss and are now going to be pretty negative. Now he is showing the kids the positive outlook that their season meant for everyone, including them. He did that by repeating the more positive parts of the speech so that the children can hear it more. No, no, that's now we're just anything. I repeated that so you will hear me. And the kids, these are, these are 12 and 13 year olds. They don't need repetition to grasp words like friends or jumping. So this was doing awesome, awesome, awesome pants until we got right around here. He did that by repeating the more positive parts of the speech. So the children would focus on their success in earning respect instead of their failure to earn a title. The repetition of positive phrases and words in the speech showed the kids what they had to smile about. I don't watch the slide, make it stick, no. Okay, so this one right here is actually our closest to a rhetorical analysis paragraph. Little zhuzhing, this one would definitely be a go. Where is the number one place kids are having trouble? Yeah, it's the topic sentence. So let's take a look at a couple. Tony Romo was faced with a difficult dilemma, different than what he had expected. He was forced to adapt to his new surroundings and given new life challenges. Do you have an author? Do you have a rhetorical choice? No. What language is he using? This should say something like his decision to use negative diction. I don't know. But yeah, there's, there's no 
rhetorical choice here. And there's no broad message about the world in general. Okay. How about this one? Lou Gehrig's retirement speech utilized the rhetorical choices of repetition and personal anecdote to drive home his message to his audience that he is a lucky individual, even though he is struck with a terrible disease. Do you have a rhetorical choice? Yeah, you have a problem that you have too. And this might be a thesis, but the problem is a paragraph, one paragraph, one rhetorical choice. And here I have two, which is not ideal. Do you have a message? Yes. Again, little too tightly, narrowly focused. Um, it would be better if it focused on uh, to his audience that um, individuals sh uh, that individuals can revel in their personal success even when struck with a terrible disease. So, because he's not just talking about himself personally. Okay, let's take a look at this one. During a press conference, Tony Romo, that seemed to come up more than the others, uh, demonstrates through pathos the appeal to emotion that even though one's dreams are crushed, he, she has to keep his, her head up. Do you have a rhetorical choice? Yes. Do you know what I'm going to say about using pathos as a rhetorical choice? Yeah, I'm going to say don't get so technical. Demonstrates through an appeal to strong emotion. Don't get technical. Do you have a message? Yes, but please don't do this awkwardness. <laughs> do you know the easy way to fix that? Instead of using singular, just use plural. That even uh, though people's dreams are crushed, now you get to use they have to keep their heads up. By the way, whoop, why are you doing that? By the way, sometimes kids do this. They have to keep their head up. Really, all of them together have one head. No. If it's plural, make it all plural. Uh, but make sure that you are not, that, that awkwardness is going to cost you. Okay. In Coach Dave, uh, last name I can't pronounce, speech to the Cumberland Americans, he uses repetition in order his, to convey his message to not give up and to keep going because even though they didn't win this time, they made friends for life. Do you have rhetorical choice? Yep. Repetition. Do you have a message? Yep, but it could be more tightly phrased uh, to convey his message that an individual failure does not diminish the intangible successes one has earned. Because it's not just about friendship, it's also about respect, it's also about pride. So, But this one is a little bit closer. A lot of you guys, whether you succeeded or failed, it was in the first sentence. So hopefully that helped. Talk to you soon.